<laughs> they changed the plane. How do I do this? Um, I'll figure it out and then I'll get back to you. Our flight tonight departs just after dinner time, which in Dubai is 2 a.m. Eluding the sun, we'll fly over Saudi Arabia, the Balkans, and much of Central Europe to arrive in the Netherlands shortly after sunrise. Here, I'll spend a day in Amsterdam, heading out again the following morning. Going back to the airport, I'll catch my next flight, which will take me across the Atlantic, over Iceland and Greenland, cutting across eastern Canada to arrive in Toronto. Now, this video is considerably long, not because I intended it to, but rather because it does span two flights. You see, the first one was supposed to be on a 777, and the second a 787. However, as you'll see later in the video, I was ruthlessly robbed of the Dreamliner for yet another 777, a practice that is apparently very common with this airline. Nevertheless, we'll get to enjoy 15 hours of Dutch hospitality, both in the air and on the ground, in their breathtaking flagship lounge. For the past couple of years, I've been moving back to Dubai during the winters. The weather's fantastic, all my friends are here, and my dad's nearby in Riyadh. The city is exceptionally safe, incredibly modern, and filled with endless things to do. When it comes to its layout, the most well-known of the seven emirates emanates from its central axes, known as Sheikh Zayed Road, whose name is perhaps the only understatement in the country, as it's more so a 20-lane highway than anything that resembles a mere road. Connecting two downtowns and various residential neighborhoods in between, Sheikh Zayed also links the two international airports serving the city. The current airport, Dubai International, sits just north of the downtown downtown, while the soon-to-be new airport, Al Maktoum International, is a 20-minute drive from the other downtown, called the Marina, or JBR, or the winter home for half the UK's population. Dubai does have a metro system, which serves the longitudinal axes of the city quite well, connecting it to the current airport. The downside is that it does require a lengthy and oftentimes perspiration-inducing walk to reach a station, so for that reason, your best bet for getting around town would be an Uber, or better yet, the local app, Kareem. In my case though, I have a best friend in the form of an Ahmed to drive me to the airport. Ahmeds are great, everyone should get one, they drive you around for free, and you can harass them without consequence. What is that noise? It's a fucking trophy. What trophy? Trophy behind you. Oh shit, I bought you that trophy. Yeah. Hey, can no. I show the internet the trophy? No, no, oh, come no. on. I will. Oh, come on. Kill oh. I... Dubai International Airport was once in the outskirts of the city, but has since become enclosed in all signs by the urban sprawl, in no small part due to its own success. Served by five commercial concourses designated to three terminals, the airport flips convention by having the runways in the middle and the buildings on either side. Terminals 1 and 3 are located on the south side of the airfield, while T2 is positioned on the arguably less desirable due to its lack of infrastructure north side. And while T1 and T3 have a connected transit area, getting between the north and south terminals can prove to be quite a hassle. There are no airside connection options, forcing passengers to clear immigration and then to take a shuttle bus. And while the bus is free, it does only come every 20 minutes or so, leaving you, in many cases, better off with a taxi. KLM, like all the major international carriers other than Emirates, operates out of T1, so from here, we'll pick up the action. I will kill you, I will end our relationship. Yalla. Next week. See you in a week. Alright, just checked in. Um, gonna try to walk and talk at the same time because if the police see me filming other people here, they might have an issue with me. Anyways, uh, there's a lot of people behind me, as you can probably see. It's because this flight is relatively full. Business class is pretty much all the way full. Check-in agent told me there's only two free seats left. Which also means there's someone sitting next to me, which might prove to be a little bit difficult to navigate with this giant camera, but we'll see what happens. 
So terminal one here at Dubai seems to be the terminal for everyone else other than Emirates. And also maybe not the low cost carriers. Apparently those guys are in terminal two. It's not as new as terminal three. Not that bad to be fair. Just pretty standard, functional, kind of like a early 2000s Middle Eastern architectural vibe. Damn, I hate that word, vibe. You end up using it a lot in this part of the world for some reason. Anyways, I'll talk to you in the lounge. British Airways lounge. Interesting. Golf Air Falcon Gold lounge. Interesting. Malhaba lounge. Okay. Al Majlis, Dubai Airport's connecting the world. Lufthansa Senator Business Lounge. Senator and Business Lounge. I know some of you are gonna correct me if I say them in the same sentence. Ah! Sky Team Lounge. I know that this isn't the lounge we're going to, but I did want to say that the Airside Hotel here in T1 is actually pretty good. They have full size rooms for reasonable prices. It's also right across from where we're going. There are quite a number of SkyTeam flights taking off out of Dubai every day, and as such, the Alliance hosts an impressive lounge for its business class passengers and status holders. It's not hard to discern from the finishes and appointments that Air France has had a predominant role in the design and furnishings of this little European enclave. Characterful touches, as well as discreet soft lighting, gives these rooms a lived-in and inviting quality. Although, when it comes to invitations, one need not say more than this wine cellar for me to want to spend multiple eternities here. The wines themselves were pretty decent, and the breadth of the selection even more so, with multiple red, white, and sparkling varieties. There were also other choices when it comes to non-grape-based alcoholic beverages. Moving on, there was a dinner spread when I visited, and it looked to be one of the better offerings in terms of airport lounge buffets. There was a familiar salad station, and a display of cold bites, cheese, fruits, cakes, and other desserts. There were quite a few hot options, but none of them really stood out, and all of them were, if I'm being completely honest, a little bland. To be fair, I have been living in Dubai for the last little bit, so perhaps my expectations have been slightly inflated. Hmm. Anyways, there was a coffee station as well. Wrapping things up, the lounge was amenitized by a luggage storage room, a facility solo travelers will definitely appreciate. There was also a room that barely squeezes into the definition of a business center, which bizarrely had a curtain that separated it from the room next door, which turned out to be a private lounge, but once again barely fitting into that definition. My middle school English teacher is going to have an aneurysm burst from how long that sentence was. Saving the best for last, and it is inarguably the best installment in this lounge, especially here in Dubai, and that of course would be the shower. This one was a little bit small and did get quite steamy, but it did come with everything you really needed, including a Dyson hairdryer. It's not particularly good. It's not particularly bad. Here's our ride for tonight, this heavily obstructed 777, baptized in the airline's baby blue livery. I did ask if I could board a little earlier to get some shots of the cabin. Now I know that it gets in the way of objectivity from a surface standpoint, but you can't have your cake and eat it too. Besides, what are they gonna do? Put gold leaf on my cake? K 
KLM's 777s, while looking quite contemporary, are nevertheless equipped with an older concept of business class seating. Arrayed in three columns of two, the seats are plush and wide, but are otherwise lacking in privacy. My seat for tonight, 1A, offers a little bit more seclusion, but at the cost of not having direct aisle access. Also, I read somewhere on the internet that I should offer better legroom than the non-bulkhead seats behind it. To see if this claim is true, and while we're waiting for the plane to board, let's have a comprehensive look at the seat. And as always, we'll start off with the IFE monitor. This one has incredible contrast, but also overblown highlights. We'll come back to it later. Now, because this is a bulkhead row, there's a shelf just above the screens. I'm guessing it's meant for snacks or newspapers, but evidently not on this flight. Below the screen, there sits a handy trapezoidal cubby, perfectly fitting the menu and the amenity kit, both of which we'll have a closer look at later. The front row legroom allotment, as prophesied by the internet, is rather generous, handy for this red-eye flight. The footwell too offers ample space, not sure about this loose panel though. It was slightly triggering for my OCD. Moving on to the middle armrest, it's a classic 2000s design with those deeply unsatisfying bubble buttons for seat controls. There is a hole punch privacy divider, and below that, crammed into the side of the console, you'll find the literature pocket and the Panasonic IFE remote. The tray table is also stowed in the middle console and can be extracted like this, slid aggressively forwards, and folded open. It's relatively sturdy, but when deployed, does limit your options for leaving your seat if you wish to keep your lower body attached. Over on the outboard side, the armrest can be pushed down into the seat to free up some shoulder space when sleeping. And back here, within easy reach, only if you are in orangutan, there is a small enclave for storage, power delivery, and a headphone interface. Within the shell of the seat, you'll find a small reading light and some easy access controls for when the bed is reclined. And on the subject of the bed, which is just the seat back as KLM does not provide mattress toppers, well, there's a thick layer of padding and no leather to be found, so it's a thumbs up from me. Service on the ground started with a welcome drink and a handing out of menus. Specialty cocktail selection of just one drink wasn't all that exciting, but the wines were better. One champagne and a couple decent looking choices each for reds and whites. This eight hour red eye flight will have two hot meals, a quick supper just after takeoff, and another hot breakfast right before landing. Supper was served over a bumpy Saudi east coast shortly after takeoff. The crew wasted no time taking orders while we were still on the ground, maximizing time in the air spent unconscious. Everything came on one tray, but no complaints here, as it was way past even Dubai's bedtime. I do appreciate it when airlines take the time and energy to add the little touches of the countries and regions from whence they hail. Food itself is perhaps the most universal way to share one's culture, but not far behind are the crockery and other vessels that the food comes in. Marcel Wanders has been the designer of KLM service elements for many years now, something I discovered when the Delphware evoked my curiosity enough for me to Google it. 
These clog-shaped salt and pepper shakers were also a charming touch. It's a good thing they're made out of plastic, for if it were wood, probably would have stolen them. All right, that's enough of the flatware flattery, let's actually talk about the food. On this occasion, I went with the lamb biryani. And I know it's not very Dutch, but neither was the only other option, the chicken satay. Regardless, catering out of the XP is almost always excellent, and this meal was no exception. This take on the classic Mughal lamb and rice dish was impressive. It was moist in all the right ways, allowing the well-calibrated aromatics to blend in well with the muted humidity in the airplane air. With that said, the portions were a little stingy. I wish I had some food in the lounge since this meal ultimately left me still feeling a little hungry. There was some pretty spectacular cheese, but once again not enough crackers, and while this dessert tart was pretty good, I finished it in one bite. Perhaps this is the airline's way of combating the extra pounds one inevitably gains while in Dubai, or perhaps I'm just getting fat. The bathrooms on this plane were nothing special. They were your standard Boeing affair with a good amount of usable counter space. There were tulip scented hand lotions, body mists, and this mystery concoction. Also on theme was this actual tulip. And when I say actual, what I mean is actually artificial. Before we turn in for the night, let's have a look at the overnight pouch, otherwise known as the amenity kit. It included the usual suspects, socks, eye shade, and some cosmetics, with the lip balm coming in handy for my chap lips. It also included an adorable little pen. And no, they didn't offer separate kits for men and women, everyone got the same stuff. Moving on to the sleeping situation, the seat fully reclines into a lie flat bed, and at this point I was thankful for the bulkhead seat since my feet had ample room to thrash about in. This was definitely not the most spacious business class bed, and definitely places low on the list when it comes to privacy. But surprisingly, it wasn't that bad. I was able to sleep on my back and side without having too many complaints, and also without hitting my arms and knees on too many things. While the pillow was plush and supportive, the duvet I found was a little too thick for the temperature of the cabin, so instead of using it as a comforter, I put it over the seat as a mattress in lieu of an actual one. Despite the lack of individualized air vents, they didn't keep the cabin too hot on this flight, so it wasn't too hard to fall asleep. Oh, good morning, guys. Um, got about 40 minutes left to go. Slept surprisingly well. I was actually shocked by how comfortable this bed was. There was a lot of room. I got like a decent four hours of sleep. Woke up once, I think, over Greece. There was a little bit of turbulence, but it wasn't difficult to go back to sleep, and it wasn't hard to stay asleep. Yeah, pretty, pretty good bed. I'm impressed. Um, they did turn the lights on about an hour ago, so that was interesting. But apart from that, pretty happy. Let's get some breakfast. Remember when I said that DXP catering is usually excellent? And don't get me wrong, the cold items on the spread definitely were, but this shakshuka left me, as my dad would say, dejectedly disappointed. Now I'm a big fan of shakshuka, but this was not that. The eggs in this were ostensibly hard boiled, and the sauce tasted more like borscht than anything with enough kick to be considered even remotely maghreb. All of that is to say that it kinda sucked, but thankfully there were enough cold items and warm bakeries to stop my complaining. The crew left me with a very strong coffee, and to go with that, very appropriately at 6am, a miniature Delft house filled with non-miniature gin. These are supposed to be taken home as a souvenir, with the airline coming out with a new design every year. As of the posting of this video in 2023, there are 103 designs, one for each year that the airline has not been bankrupt. My 
layover in Amsterdam was short but sweet. I spent the day doing what most tourists do and walked along the canals taking in the sights and the smells, mostly of marijuana mixed with canal water. evening, my friends who live in the city took me out for dinner, after which we went on another walk, mostly so that I can get this mediocre b-roll footage. Sorry, this is YouTuber life. Okay, made it into the airport. I just checked my bags. Apparently a bus flipped over near the airport. That's why there was a huge queue of cars. My little driver who was driving for 21 years around here has never seen anything like it at Schiphol. She was commenting on it quite a lot. But I made it in here and um, the airlines figured out who I am and have arranged for an escort for me. This is my new friend Talia. <laughs> oh, this video is gonna be a lot different than I had imagined, oh man. All right, anyways, we're off to the lounge. Let's see what happens. I'll follow you? Yes. All right, let's go. Oh, like a shipwreck, I cut the sails loose. We didn't have a long wait before boarding today, so I spent most of the time I did have exploring KLM's flagship lounge. The Crown Lounge, as it's called, is a sprawling facility with countless rooms and endless amenities deserving a video of its own, which is exactly what I'm going to do, and when that's done, you'll be able to see a pop-up in the corner or a link in the description. But in this timeline, as impressed as I was with the lounge, I had the more pressing matter of escaping my blue suit of captors. The key doesn't like you today. No. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, fine. Okay, I'm hiding out in the showers, managed to shake my entourage, have a moment for myself. Sadly, I don't think I have time to actually take a shower, but the showers are pretty nice and I'm going to take this opportunity to change into some fresh clothes, which should be, you know, 30% as good as taking a shower. But um, yeah, I'll try to continue to evade my pursuers and get you some footage of the lounge and tell you the rest in voiceover. I know I said that I'll make a full video, but I also did want to highlight some of this lounge in this review for those of you too lazy or too otherwise preoccupied with eating to click out. I'm going to start off by saying how much space there is in here, and not just space for attractions and amenities, but also plain seating. Too many lounges make the mistake of cramming in stuff, but without enough butt parking. This place was not that. One of the most important parts of a lounge is the food, of which there were quite a few varieties on offer in this one. A common quality I found about the food here is just how homey it is. Everything was fresh, approachable, and unpretentious. That, along with the five million people fighting over it, made it feel kind of like grandma's house. An arguably even more important element of a lounge is the alcohol on offer, and that here was in no short supply. Anywho, that's a quick look. There's way too much to cover in here, so in an effort not to make this video super long, we'll leave it for the other one and continue with our day. Thank you guys so much, thank you. If I look okay? <laughs> I'm looking forward to the new version of this camera. It has a flip out screen so I can see myself. So this is B-roll in case I need extra footage. Then I have my face bobbing around instead of a black screen to talk over. So, <laughs> so I figured this out by now. I, I think, is that us? We're F7, right? Yeah. 
Like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, this flight was originally supposed to be on a Dreamliner with the airline's updated seating. But they did what is called in the industry a catfish bait and switch to another 777. I tried really hard to see if this plane had any noticeable differences from the one I took the day before. It did not. One thing I will say is that the color scheme looks even more tired and dated under daylight. The airline staff let me board a full 20 minutes before the posted boarding time. I didn't really know what to do, so I went for a walk. This KLM aircraft is a little bit more communistically inclined, featuring only two classes, although the airline has begun to retrofit their Boeing fleet with premium economy. This economy cabin does look to be quite smart though with these newer Recaro seats. And yes, it's the same company that makes the racing seats. Seeing that I was bored, one of the off-duty pilots led me up to the flight crew rest area. This is located above the forward galley and the first few rows of business class, in the space that would otherwise be taken up by the central luggage bins. And don't worry, they're not dead pixels on your screen, just dust on my camera lens. Sorry about that. Eventually, I was done snooping around the plane, so the flight attendant gave me a beer as I went back to my seat. Here's the making the best out of unfortunate consequences that really aren't a big deal to begin with. I see no reason to whine about it. However, it does mean that I will have to fly this airline again sometime in the future to try out the Dreamliner. So um, I get to drink more Heinekens on airplanes. Like, a thought has crossed my mind. Pre-takeoff beers are definitely the way to go. I mean, it's still alcohol, but it quenches your thirst, unlike champagne or wines, which don't. Yeah. Fly KLM just for the beer before takeoff. On this flight, I had a middle seat, so I relocated myself to an empty economy row to watch the takeoff. Taking advantage of the fact that I don't have a seat neighbor on this flight, let's have a closer look at the dividing elements. At the risk of sounding American, I'm gonna say that it looks as if they shot up their own plane, with .22 rounds no less. The middle shelf was also noticeably rounder and bigger. This was a daytime flight, and I'm not one to usually take naps, but I still thought we'd have a look at the bed set up in these middle seats. And immediately the claims of subpar footwell space has been verified. If you have feet, they're not gonna fit. While the aisle side facing armrest does go down, it does also mean that if your arm or elbow hangs over the edge, they run the risk of being victimized by passing people, or worse, trolleys. Speaking of trolleys, they left the galley right after takeoff with a beverage service. I took this flight on the tail end of COVID, so while my salted nuts came in a packet, these nuts do now come in proper china. I really like these glasses. There were two meals on this flight, with lunch served right after takeoff. For this, I opted for the fancy sounding pulled duck salad. This dish did live up to its namesake's opulence, meaty yet immaculately balanced by the accompaniment. It was, however, very cold, which took away a little bit from the flavor. Committing to day drinking, I opted to try everything on the airline specialty cocktail list, which consisted of just one item, this Negroni. It was alright, 
but I'm not a big fan of Negronis. For the main, I went with the miso salmon coconut udon noodle thing. I too was very confused with the eccentric amalgam of ingredients, but was still curious enough to order it. And I'm glad I did because this was actually really, really good. Definitely among the most memorable dishes I've had on an airplane. The salmon was cooked to perfection, and the noodles were oodling with saucy, savory, salvation screaming scrumptiousness. That wasn't in the script, but I'm keeping that in. For dessert, I opted for the cheese plate. My favorite out of the three merited contenders was the blue, but that might just be my personal affinity for blue cheese. This came with a generous pour of port and a chocolate, once again in the shape of a Dutch canal house. Overall, this meal was top notch. Its higher quality over the previous flights was evident. Needless to say, it left me quite happy and very full. With a few more hours to kill and not much left to show you, let's have a very quick look at the IFE. The interface was not that great, functional but characterless. It did have enough content to keep adults and children alike content for at least a few hours, with a small but interesting selection of classic movies, and an even smaller one for contemporary and newly released ones. The same can't be said for TV shows, lots of programs here, and there was even a category specific for binge watching, an activity perfectly suited for longer flights. The route map was handled by the standard Panasonic software, which is still the best in the industry. There were, however, no outboard camera views. The screen isn't too far out of reach from the seat, but it's still not all that comfortable to use a touchscreen, so the handset remote is a handy addition. Over-the-ear headsets are provided, and they're not the ugliest, nor are they the most uncomfortable, neither were they the worst in terms of noise cancellation and sound quality. So in other words, they were pretty excellent. And for those of you who keep asking, no, you can't take these home, you have to give them back at the end of the flight. I spent most of this flight getting some work done over the recently installed, decently reliable, and reasonably priced Wi-Fi. It wasn't very full in business, so the crew were extra attentive to each passenger, not just me and my extra large camera. They patrolled the aisles, bringing out endless snacks and drinks. I've always thought that if Canada was France, then Quebec would be Belgium. And now that I've managed to piss off every single French speaker, let's move on to the fourth and final meal of this little KLM adventure. There were two choices for this meal, a plant-based burger, which I was told is not very good, and this thing, the Queen of Argentina, which I found out for myself is also not very great. What it is, is an empanada, proudly made in Amsterdam, and stuffed with chicken tiki masala. The highlight of this meal was definitely this fluffy little egg tart, giving a sweet and savory finish to our KLM culinary experience. After my tray was cleared, I was presented with a whole development of gin-filled Delft houses, and I was told I can take as many as I wanted, so I came home with this pair. They kind of remind me of Sully and Wazowski from Monsters, Inc. Or maybe they're just houses. All right, as we're about to come into land, let me share with you some of the thoughts and observations I've had about KLM over the past two days. 
Some of you will know that I'm a big sucker for the little touches that an airline employs to showcase the colors and culture of its country. In this regard, the Dutch flag carrier does a pretty fantastic job without it being too overwhelming. And I'm not just talking about the pretty porcelain and imitation tulips, but also the values the people of the Netherlands hold dear. Values I saw firsthand having once dated a girl from Amsterdam. She had this honest pragmatism, an enviable industriousness, shied away from excess, and had a love for hard draw. Okay, maybe not that one. What I mean to say is, while I don't see KLM winning any awards for being the most luxurious airline, I do see customers coming back for what they know will be a consistent and reliable service. I can see how this airline, much like its sister company Air France, targets its business class product towards, well, business people, frequent flyers, work trippers, and commuters who just want to get to where they're going in relative comfort and without any fuss. I am also looking forward to trying their 787 eventually, having heard a lot of good things about the seat. If you've made it this far in the video, thank you for watching. Also, really, you can watch a KLM review for 36 minutes? Genuinely though, thank you guys for all the love and support you've shown my weird little hobby. And especially thanks to all the mega simps out there who have subscribed to the channel. Until I see you guys the next time, safe travels.